Welcome to Vital for Colorado Radio, part of the Connect and Collaborate Network. I am your on-air producer, John Ekstrom, joined by the host, the chairman and CEO of Vital for Colorado, Peter Moore. Thank you for joining us once again. Well, thanks a lot, John. This is a real high point of, uh, of, of my month, and I uh, get to talk to really interesting people. And uh, today we're, we're with uh, Senator Sherry John. Uh, from Wheat Ridge, uh, and I think you're in the legislature for about 20 years, and term limits have uh, faced you, and we're fortunate enough that uh, uh, you've decided to join the board of Vital for Colorado. So you've, uh, you've uh, come to our, our first board meeting, and it's uh, great getting to know you, and I'm happy you showed up today so we can get to know you better. Well, I am very happy to be here. Yeah, welcome to the show, <coughs> Sherry. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. We've... Um, you know, as, as you have an organization like Vital, you're always looking for interesting and talented people with, with diverse backgrounds, and certainly with your background as a state legislator, both in the State House and State Senate, uh, you're a small business owner, it's, uh, it's a thrill. You bring a great perspective to Vital. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, you are a Colorado native. I am a Colorado native. Okay, so. Up in, in Sterling. Uh, up in which Sterling. Which a lot of people don't know. <coughs> it's uh, once you go up I-76, you hit Sterling, you go, hey, look at this. This is uh, it's a delightful town. It I is. was there just a month ago, I think. And, you know, one of the interesting parts uh, that my colleagues downtown didn't even know is that uh, we had a connection with <coughs> the Sonnenbergs because oh, yeah. they had, you know, a very large uh, feedlot there. And um, so we had a, a connection, you know, between the two of us. But, yes, um, grew up in Sterling when I was 13 years old. My parents... Uh, knew that the highway was coming through because uh, my dad ran the Bluebird Cafe and uh, gas station. That's what he did. Really? And said, okay, well, you know, it's probably time to move on because this is going to wipe this out. And so huh. we moved back to Denver, which they had lived previously. You'd think with the started. highway coming, there'd be more opportunity, right? It'd no, because it was well, going to bypass. Well, not the highway is going right oh, through your bypass. business. No, and, yeah. and it was going to, it would take people bypass oh. that, sure. so... Yeah. Okay. So we moved to Wheat Ridge, and I'm one of those people just kind of plant me, and <laughs> I will stay there forever. And you'll so, grow, right? That's right, and I will grow. Are you uh, are you an alumnus of Wheat Ridge High School? I am. I'm a farmer. Uh, I'm a demon, so hopefully we can get along here. <laughs> yeah. uh, Crosstown rivals here, but uh, that's the way it goes. Um, tell us a little bit more about, uh, so you're in Wheat Ridge. Uh, what, what happened after that? What was the journey like? Uh, getting to where I am now? Sure. Well, starting out, I, um, you know, just like every other parent, guardian, grandma, grandpa, everybody likes to be involved in their kid's school. And I was very involved with the PTA and then the accountability. And from there, you just kind of, you know, work within the community stuff. I was a single mom raising three kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's challenging. <laughs> uh, but I had a small business that I kept simply because it was the hours were so great to raise kids. I have a house cleaning company, and it's been over 40 years now. Never meant to stay that long, <laughs> but it has served the purpose well because it has given me the flexibility to do the things that I love. But as a single mom, um, I found very quickly that I loved being in issues and uh, being active in the community. So when Mo Keller was term limited, uh, Ed Perlmutter, who was the senator at that time for the district. Wow, Ed um, Perlmutter in the state uh -huh. senate. Yeah, That's yeah. Funny. that was a long time ago. Before you get into your legislative career, can we talk about how you started your small business? I, I'm always fascinated by people who take the leap. Uh, I, Peter is involved in more things than I can count. And Peter, you told me about when you were sort of just, I mean, you were running and gunning as a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. And you went to your leadership and you said, I want to be more active in the community. Can you revisit that a little bit for me? Yeah, I... Um, uh, and then, Sherry, we'll come back to you. Sure. Uh, really, up until about 2009, I was a real a nose the grindstone lawyer. And uh, I had just finished a stint being a managing partner of a securities law firm, an 18-lawyer securities law firm. And uh, that was great in terms of all the transactions and... Uh, then some of the folks in that law firm began to retire, and uh, I think I said to myself something along the lines of, I've never been a partner in a large law firm before. 
Uh, so I phoned up a friend of mine who was a managed partner of a large national law firm, and he said, come on over. And uh, that was uh, pretty much my process of joining what uh, became uh, what is now close to an 850-lawyer law firm, about 24 offices. And uh, um, I was uh, there for eight years. And uh, when I first joined, there were a number of people that were very active in the community, of, a few of which I'm, I'm sure you, you know, Howard Gelt, uh, and uh, was very, very active and, and had been active uh, really going back to year 2000, all sorts of things. Uh, Gene Commander was the uh, managing partner of that law firm. And so they sent me down to the South Denver Metro Chamber, and I just went there and said, well, I'd like to help if I can. And uh, they turned out to have a need for a lawyer. And they said, I would like to be on our board and uh, our lawyer. And I said, sure. Uh, so I kind of bypassed a lot of people that had been probably working to be on the board. Uh, and uh, I was a uh, board chairman, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a board member and legal counsel for seven years, I think. Um, and so that's... Uh, it's not very dramatic, but I just went to my partner and said, well, go on and talk to this guy. They could probably use your help. <laughs> and they said and, yes. And, and, and my life changed. And my life changed. I, yeah. uh, since then, I really have spent 20, 30 percent of my time uh, on local communities with chambers of commerce. And I belong to many things uh, currently. Uh, founded Vada for Colorado, which now is 87,000 Colorado citizens. Is, Coalition members, over a thousand businesses, 180 trade associations, and uh, a brand new board member, Sherry John, Senator John. Well, sometimes uh, you have to give people the opportunity to say yes. Uh, and as with any business that you start, you almost have to go to them and give them the opportunity to say yes. Would you like to hire me? Would you like to? Would you like me to work for you? That's Let true. them say yes. That's absolutely true. So, how did you get started with uh, with? Uh, it's Colorado Housekeeping Services, uh -huh. right? It is. Um, well, interestingly enough, I was in retail. Okay. I didn't have kids at the time. You know, worked 60 to 70 hours a week. Oh, my. Yeah. In retail, when you're, when you're managing and when you're doing yeah. buying, it's just a lot of hours. Well, I knew that was not going to work <laughs> to have a family. No. Um, and so as I was leaving there, I thought, what in the world am I going to do? What am I going to do? A friend came to me and said, you don't know anybody that cleans houses because, like, my sister really needs somebody. And I went, no, eh, I have a friend that does it. And hmm. You know, she said, well, this is what it is. It's over in Cherry Creek. And I said, well, I'm not working right now. I could use extra money. I'll just go clean it. Well, there you go. <laughs> then she had a friend, and she had a friend, and she had a friend. But what I realized, because then I did, we did start a family, it was so perfect to run the schedule around my kids. It wasn't an eight to five. Yeah. And so as they went to school, I could still get them to soccer, I could get them to football, I could get them to baseball, um, and hire people to, yeah. do, to do the work as I worked along with them. And it just went from there. It wow. just grew from there. And so, so 40 years plus you've been at this Yes. <laughs> what were some of the tough lessons along the way? Because I know starting my own business, there's your business, right? There's the thing that you're good at. There's cleaning houses, that's where you're making money. And then there's everything else which is really, really challenging. Well, and I think, you know, hiring people. And how do you hire good people? Yeah. And what are the laws around, the employment laws, oh, and, sure. and needing to get educated on all of that? Um, understanding uh, when you're messing with chemicals, you know, you have to have um, kind of a background in making sure that you have everything posted. It's just there's things, you just don't know what you don't know. Right. And that's why it's so important that you know, like within the state, that they have a place where people can go to say, what is it I don't know? Uh, the insurances that you have to carry. Oh, sure. Oh, my gosh. It's, I have five. How, how, how you large have five did insurances? The, how large did the uh, company grow to at, at, at its high point uh, in terms of employees? You know, we, we never got huge because I was so busy downtown right. in the legislature <laughs> at that time. But we probably ran a cruise of 17, 17 people. Oh, Sherry, come on. It's a citizen legislature, right? I know. There's well, no I, time. Uh, it's half yeah. time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, I, and as I've come to learn, that's a total farce. Um, so you were talking about <coughs> your activism and sort of being interested in civic issues. What compelled you to run finally? Um. They asked me to. I had no idea that they even really knew who I was, except that you would see Mo Keller, you would see Ed Perlmutter at 
you know, events. Sure. And I, you know, knew him enough to say hello. So when they actually asked me to run because Mo Keller was term limited, my first response to them was like, so what would I do? <laughs> At that point, I was sure that they thought, oh, never mind. But I said, just describe a day to me. Yeah. And I had been very involved in the community mm -hmm. and worked, you know, on issues within the school and the community. So, you know, when they talked about the issues and the policies and uh, being able to, to do things for the communities, of course, that was right up my alley. And I said, I would love to do something like that. So... And not just something like that, but you're going to now do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the most fun part was out knocking on doors. To this day, I still love knocking on doors. Wow. Well, that's how you connect with your community. That's how you know what your community really thinks. Sure. And, and you're not coming in with some crazy pitch, too. You're not the, you're not the fuller brush lady. No. You know? You're, you're going and saying, hey, I want to represent you. And so mm -hmm. tell me about you. What are your pain points? What are your pressure points? I could get how that would be. Uh, really, really energizing because sometimes door knocking, I mean, I've done that in my career quite a bit. It's not always the easiest thing. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out your tenure. Was it 16 years or 18 16. years? 16. 16. The reason it's not 18 is because I termed out of the House in 2008 was my last session. Okay. But the Senate seat was not opened. Mo Keller was still in the Senate at that time because she went from the House to the Senate. Uh -huh. So there was a two-year Got it. Where I had to sit out, which I didn't sit out because I did, but I was in a primary. So oh. the day after session got out, I started knocking doors again. <laughs> so instead of getting a vacation. Yeah. I'm, and then you're in campaign mode. I mean, that's got to be hard mm -hmm. when you're in the, in the house. You're doing that every two years. Mm -hmm. um, what, um, what would you say is, is one of the things that you've learned most from running, I mean, 16 years is, is an impressive legislative career uh, from running and winning that many times. What is the most, imp what is the most impressive part? What's something you've, you've taken away from that? What, what's a learning that, that you've taken from not only, I mean, having to advocate for yourself that many times. Well, I think that regardless of whether you're out um, campaigning, mm -hmm. I believe that when you're serving, that you are campaigning every single day because those people deserve to have you at their door. They deserve to have the phone calls. They deserve to have coffee. Somebody calls me and says, I really have this issue. Um, I say, well, you know, you can come downtown or I'll meet you at the, at the Starbucks coffee shop. Um, I think the most important thing a person can want to do is connect with the citizens in their district not the parties, right. but the citizens, because that's really who you're representing. And the wonderful part to me was I wasn't elected to just serve one party. I was elected to serve the district. That's a lot of people. Sure. I mean, that's folks who didn't vote for you as well. I think I'll uh, count that as 18 years. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like 18 years of service to me. Uh, I can't think of anybody uh, offhand. I'm, I'm sure there must have been other people, but can you think of people that served longer than 18 years? Do you know what? I absolutely can, and I'm very, very good friends with her today, and that's Norma Anderson. Okay. Senator Anderson. Uh, she actually, when I first went into the house, uh, you know, and I remember, mm -hmm. I'm a single mom, yeah. and I have a house cleaning company. I'm not a doctor, not a lawyer, right. not an accountant. Um, I said, holy Toledo, what do I do now? <laughs> and I was very, very seriously thinking they have made a huge mistake and they're going to need to find somebody to replace me because I don't even know what these people are talking about. Oh, right. Water? I know nothing about. Yeah, you turn the faucet on. <laughs> so instantly I said, well, I'm going to need the smartest person in this building to teach me how to get this done because they tell me I need 33 votes, that's mm. the majority, to pass a bill in the House. And there was only 27 Democrats. Mm, interesting. Huh, I'm going to need some friends. So I called Norma Anderson and said, this is Sherry John. And she said, well, honey, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I would be so grateful if you would give me 30 minutes of your time. And we have been very close ever since because she totally mentored me and helped me to learn that process. I remember uh, we had Greg Brophy on this show, uh. and uh, he told us a very similar story about you know, he, he wanted to get involved as well. He was listening to talk radio on his tractor and started to get involved with Wayne Allard. And then, like you, they said, would you ever consider running for office? And he goes, 
I sure. I mean, I you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things when someone proposes it to you, it seems insane, right? It was totally insane to me. My kids were, I mean, astounded. And I said, now, and they actually said, Kelly said to me, Mom, would you get paid for this one? Because everything else you volunteer for, <laughs> would you actually get paid? <laughs> get some money for this one? <laughs> now, as a single mom, I have to tell you, I was very grateful to get that extra income. Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, many of your, uh, of the things you've described about your experience are people, are, are things that people want and like and expect, uh, but in today's world is so scarce. Uh, and I was just listening to you and you were talking about you got there, you realized you need to reach across the aisle because you couldn't do your job unless you had some friends from the other party. Mm -hmm. uh, your emphasis uh, of you represent the people, you don't represent the parties. You have a duty to that and uh, asking for help. Uh, there are not a lot of people in the world, people are sometimes so prideful. They're uh, instant geniuses, just as, you know, add water and they know everything. Uh, but there's a humility involved in that. And uh, it's very refreshing. Uh, I just want to tell you that your attitude, which uh, I'm sure was through the entire 18-year time period, is very, very refreshing. And it's not the current public uh, perception of how politics is at the state level or at the national level. You sort of get this impression people are just throwing stones and rocks at each other, and it's uh, the Flintstones or something like that. Right, it's like the Hatfields and McCoys. Anymore. Hatfields and McCoys. Oh. Uh, but anyway, that, that's what came across in just uh, four or five minutes. I was listening to you and I said, that is refreshing. Well, and the saddest part is what you're describing is absolutely true. Right. Um, I think that's one of the things that bothered me the most. From day one, I don't really care who's, what party anybody's in. Right. I have an issue, mm -hmm. and it's a state issue, and it's going to take all of us to solve it. And I really don't care who gets credit for it. Right. Yeah, I really don't give, care who gets credit for it. Um, one of the first awards that I won, and I still have it today because it was very exciting to me, was uh, they had one actually made. Um, and it was through the construction industry. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard hat. Um, and it was called the Bridge Builder. Oh, because cool. that's, that's what I do. Um, and I think that that's how you teach your kids to solve conflicts and you do consensus and you, yeah. you build relationships and it should continue to be that way. And we have lost a lot of that downtown. Uh, yeah, it seems to the, the qualities that you're describing that you espouse and that you live by uh, seem like they are in short supply, as Peter articulated. And that's I mean, that's very dispiriting. It's it, not to quote George Costanza here, but we're trying to have a society here. Mm -hmm. And I completely understand why the citizens are so upset, and they should be. Mm. And they should be. And they should be holding their legislators to task. Um, it has become about uh, the parties that are in control, not about the issues and policy and what's best for the state. It's about who gets to be in charge. Yeah. And that's always going to cause problems because this side doesn't want that side to get credit, and that side doesn't want that side to get credit. And if you think about it, uh, among the very, very many issues that face the legislature, uh, it doesn't really matter who gets the credit. What matters most is getting stuff done. And uh, perhaps you can reserve that kind of uh, uh, partisanship to maybe four or five issues. Then beyond that, Correct. let's just do our job and do our right. work. And there are things that you're always going to have, you know, a, a party that, that it, it's just, this is just where we stand. Right. But on right. all of the rest of it, it can't transportation. Be, but it can't be every I, issue. No, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Well, and here's the thing. I think people are misunderstanding who their team actually is. Let's remember that it's not Republicans versus Democrats. We're all Coloradans here. At the end of the day, we all got to live together. We, we all have to use the services, so... Well, and, and everything I say, you know, the, the people downtown have heard over and over for years. But I think one of the saddest parts of politics today is that it has become about uh, people, the organizations that fund the parties, and that's who they become beholden to. Ah. So it doesn't even matter what the policy says. I've had so many times on both sides of the aisle, uh, colleagues come to me and say, oh, God, that was such an awful bill, or that was such a great bill. I wish I could have voted for it. I wish I could have voted against it, but hmm, oh, boy, that group would have been really upset. 
No, it you know what it doesn't matter, and that's why I was always in trouble too. <laughs> Is, is this type of thing, this milieu that you're describing, is that what ultimately facilitated your exit from the Democratic Party in your last year? Do you know what it was? And I have to tell you that over the years, I've, um, I've carried the brunt a lot of uh, being kind of the, out, the outcast. You've and, taken a lot of heat. Yeah, but I always slept well. Hmm. I could always go to bed and, um, and sleep well uh, when, when I was so... Wondering if I was ever going to make it and be smart enough to do what they all did because I you know, was not from a legal background or anything. A um, really, really smart person said to me, it was actually at the Congress in Perlmutter, so he was the state senator, remember. He said, okay, stop. You only have to remember one thing. And I said, well, you better be telling me what it is. <laughs> and he said, you know what? When you go to bed at night, you, be able to, you better be able to sleep with yourself. And when you wake up in the morning, you better like who you see in the mirror. Mm. And if you always vote that way, you're going to be fine. And so I wrote that down on a little card and said, okay, <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. And I've, I lived by that. For all the years I was there, I lived by that. Wow. So it might have been the opposite of what my side wanted, my party wanted. But it's what my cons the citizens in my district wanted. But that was really at the very end of your career. And were you still invited to the, de the Democrat caucus? Uh, did they uh, know? Well, you know what? They I were guess actually... you were pushed totally outside the tent or halfway outside the tent. So, you know, I, could, I, I, had a really, I have a really good sense. I have a really good uh, intuition. And I could tell that things probably eh, weren't quite going that way once I made the decision to go unaffiliated. And I think half of them wanted me to stay in there and the other half didn't. My reason for doing this was never to um, upset the apple cart. I, they can do what they do. I just couldn't be a part of that. Yeah, live and let live, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so I just said, you know what? I'm going to caucus by myself. And so <laughs> I had a wonderful caucus on Tuesdays. I didn't, nobody argued with me. Yeah. And, um, so I just chose to just, you know, really go off on my own. Um, so, wow. Lucia Guzman was so supportive. Right. She was very supportive well, of my great. decision and of me. She's she's awesome. She's she was always very supportive. Well, that's what I was wondering. I don't know how the uh, politics work in particular, but I can see a strategy where you'd still be invited to some aspects, uh, because probably your fundamental attitudes about many many issues stayed the same, and so you'd be. Uh, a reliable person, even though you're not part of the Democrat Party anymore. Yeah, an asset. F an asset from the point of view of getting something done. One of the things that I continue to do, yeah. and I think this is one of the things they were afraid that wouldn't happen, is I did everything exactly the same as I had always done it. Right. And when they needed me to come build that bridge across the aisle, I was there to do that. Mm. And so I continued working with both sides so that we could you know, uh, get things done, because that's just what you're supposed to do. Well, we don't have time enough time in this uh, segment, but I'd uh, during our next segment, uh, perhaps we can have a little bit how we can get that back in the Colorado legislature, because what you're yeah, describing right. sounds about right to me. Thank you. And Sherry, we'll also talk about in the next segment uh, some things that you're passionate about. We're, we'll discuss the opioid crisis. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what's ahead for Vital. Uh, would love to revisit a little bit of you bucking the party uh, because this is an issue near and dear to our heart uh, when it comes to oil and gas because, you know, you are representing Wheat Ridge, which, does, which doesn't have any uh, activity. You, you're a single mom. You've got a, a cleaning company. So I'm, I'm curious about how you came to the issues. So we'll cover that in our next segment. Uh, stay tuned. Vital for Colorado is on the radio as part of the Connect and Col Collaborate Network. We've got Peter Moore, our chairman and CEO, Sherry John, uh, state senator, as well as new board member. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Vital for Colorado Radio. We've got Peter Moore, our chairman and CEO, and Sherry John, our brand new board member. First, a little bit about Vital for Colorado. You can visit vitalforcolorado.com. That's V-I-T-A-L-F-O-R Colorado. Dot com. We have a lot of material on there, including every episode of this show. 
which you can find under the Learn tab. It's videos and podcasts. You can see this. We are in our third season. We're a coalition of 87,000 people now. Peter, did you ever think we would get to 87,000 people? I mean, quite honestly, uh, we also have been in existence now for five years. And uh, uh, again, came from a Chamber of Commerce background. And I thought if we had a couple thousand members and a few hundred businesses, we'd be knocking it out of the park. That'd be aces. And uh, had no idea that we'd be around five years and growing and having a, a board that and have people such as you that uh, would want to join the board. And uh, in terms of grassroots organizations, uh, I believe we are the largest in the history of the state, except for maybe the Constitutional Amendment uh, <laughs> Convention in the uh, 1870s. That might have been larger, but uh, uh, 87,000 is just astounding. It's remarkable. And, and we're Educating and advocating regarding uh, responsible energy development. We're not looking for a particular result. We're looking for responsible processes and predictable results so that uh, people can uh, come and do business in Colorado and do so environmentally safe. So, Sherry, I mean, you fit philosophically with VITAL. We try to be the voice of the rational middle. We're not advocating. Uh, we're, we're, we're advocating for responsible energy development, but not for anything necessarily in particular unless it harms what we're trying to do here. So in this segment, we're going to talk a little bit about oil and gas, but first I think we're going to talk about mental health, which is one of the issues that, uh, that you've championed. Peter. I'll well, you know, you. just with uh, your 16 or 18 years uh, in terms of Colorado, uh, Colorado legislature, uh, uh, there are many, many things that you've done, but one thing that I'm aware of uh, that I think you're very much involved in was back in 2016, and uh, um, I'm also involved with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, and my wife is involved too, and I think it was 2016 that uh, the state of Colorado carved out $18 million of uh, very, very scarce money uh, for mental health and uh, essentially pivoted on the issue. And uh, so I want to thank you for that, because I think you're very much behind that. Well, I definitely was um, one of the supporters. I, I worked very, very hard on that. I do have to give kudos and a lot of recognition to our joint budget committee at the time and Senator uh, Patrick Stedman, who yeah. really yeah. led that charge. And, um, you know, you just cannot go anywhere that this issue is not in front of you. You may not know that. You may not recognize that. But... Uh, the way Colorado had been doing things was so behind the mark. It was just way behind. Um, and if you really think about what really is the purpose of government, because there is a purpose, that has to be a big one, is how you help to um, navigate and work with um, these uh, providers and all the people that are trying to work with uh, people with mental health. Yeah. You know, especially because it's so co-occurring to the substance yeah, use. Work on issues such disorders. as removing the stigma and helping people Absolutely. recognize as a disease and it's not as obvious as Absolutely. a broken ankle. Right. Uh, and it afflicts uh, probably every family in Colorado knows somebody, and it might be somebody very close to them, that uh, is beset by some aspect of mental illness. Uh, so for the state, anyway, I, uh, the $18 million was, was huge, but I, I, I sort of viewed that as a pivot point where the state started to recognize it. And uh, so um, what other uh, two or three uh, uh, items uh, before we start talking about politics and bottle for Colorado um, um, would you like to talk about? You know, I will always put a plug in there for uh, the co-occurring of the mental health issues and the substance use disorders and the opioid right. epidemic. Yeah. Right. Um, and as you said, Every single person knows someone. They just may not know that they know them. Yeah. Right. It is that prevalent. And removing that stigma, it is a disease. And um, for people to be able to come forward to ask for help, whether it's a mental health issue or it's a substance use disorder, they run very much together. And right. removing that stigma is... It's one of the very first parts, but we should all be talking about that in our communities. Yeah, it's it's a big deal. And one of the, the hardest things about opioids, I learned this because I, I did some work uh, in, in this field earlier this year, is that when you are addicted to opioids, you are more afraid of withdrawal than you are of dying because the withdrawal is so daunting and so terrifying and so brutal on your body mm -hmm. that it's, it's difficult to get help because 
it's better to keep going and maybe overdose than f than face withdrawal and stigma and you know all all of the attendant issues with your family and your friends and your entire life you're going to uproot that it's very very challenging it's very challenging what's even more challenging is we have people that beg for help and there's nowhere to send them oh my there's nowhere to send them so law enforcement is out there doing their darndest and they're doing an outstanding job they're they're working with people with mental health issues they're working with people with substance use disorders they're getting them into the emergency rooms. They're putting them on 72-hour mental health holds. And then what? Yeah. Well, first of all, they don't have to keep them for 72 hours, but then they just kick them right back out. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. And the withdrawals are, from what I have been described, it's just worse than even the thought of dying. Yes. And alcohol withdrawals, you will die if you do not have a medical uh, assisted treatment. Wow. You can die from alcohol withdrawals. And people really don't know that. So uh, I certainly didn't know that. No. Peter, did you know that? Yep. You did know that. I did. And it's um, what you're describing is that this is not a police response. It's not a hospital response. It's a community response. It's education. It's resource. It's empathy. Uh, it's people looking around and paying attention to people that are around them and saying, hey, this person needs help for me. I'll talk to them. Well, uh, and... and uh, <coughs> So many of our problems uh, is when nothing is done, it reaches an absolute crisis mode. And, uh, uh, you know, the average uh, story you might hear in a, a newspaper about a terrible thing that happened, uh, I don't know if the number is half of it relates to mental health, but probably something that high. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's a great issue. So I want to thank you for that. Um, you are known as a pro-business uh, Democrat and uh, since 1917, you're known as a pro-business independent, uh, and now you're known as a pro-business board member for uh, Vada for Colorado. Yeah. Uh, and I understand the uh, pro-business part, but it's had a very, very interesting history for you during your time in the legislature because of the partisanship. And uh, there were years where it was uh, 20 to 15 in the Senate, and there were other years where it was 18 to 17 in the Senate. And I would imagine uh, that being a pro-business person, you became kind of a, an important swing vote. You, you became the prettiest belle at the ball, didn't yeah. you, in a lot of ways? <laughs> I had always wanted to be the prom queen. <laughs> and now you've got everyone vying for your attention, I'm yeah. sure. So you really did it so people would just come talk to you, didn't yeah, you? That was, yeah, I just yeah. need a little more attention. Desperate cry for attention. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how did that manifest for you? What, what was that like, taking that much heat? I, I imagine there was a lot of heat from your party over some of the votes you took. Uh, how did you manage that? What was that like? Well, yeah, there was a lot of heat on a lot of the issues. Um, how did I take that? Well, I had become so used to that. Um, I just really had to stand firm. You know, we all teach our kids at the end of the day, by dang, you be true to yourself. Yeah. Don't ever sell out on that. And yeah, sometimes it would be kind of painful, but I was just, you know, I felt really good at the end of the day. I could take a stand. I knew within my entire being that it was the right position to take. And so I just took it. And there were other senators that had a similar uh, mind, so you yes. weren't totally alone. Yes. I was very sad when Senator Tocktrop and Senator Hodge were termed out before me. Right. I said, you all are leaving me. What am I going to do? Well, they, well, they <laughs> were alone. Here, ladies. <laughs> what am I going to do? Um, they, were, they were absolutely great. And, you know, Senator Tocktrop Talk will tell you every single day when, for the largest portion of the time that she ever served, you vote your district. Yeah. Not your party, your district. And she really held to that. And so did Senator Hodge. Yeah. I give them great credit. Great credit. Well, I'm thinking in particular because I was working for an E&P company at the time in 2013. Uh, there was you had Governor Hickenlooper, uh, mm -hmm. and then there was a firmly Democratic uh, House, and then it was 2015 in the Senate. And you know there were a number of things that would have been challenging to industry that would have really put a damper on the oil and gas industry. But between you, Senator Tocktrop, and Senator Hodge, there was like a backstop there. Mm -hmm. um, where anything that was too unreasonable obviously wasn't going to get through. What I'm curious about is the fact that you're from Wheat Ridge, that you own a small <laughs> business, you're a single mom. How did you come to, I don't know, understand the issues of oil and gas and become not, not necessarily a champion, but almost a voice of reason about them? Well, 
as we talked about before, I grew up in Sterling. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of oil and gas out in the northeastern part of the state. Sure. And um, my dad always would say, and sometimes I got so tired of hearing him say, it's like, yeah, dad, yeah. And that, you know what? It. Every single thing that you can touch, and there's nothing you can't get a hold of that hasn't either been mined or drilled. Mm. Um, oil and gas is huge. And the, the products, everything that we have, Everything in this room. I mean, everything that we do. And so to just not have it, part of the problem with, I think, the politics is that it goes to extreme. Mm. And that is extreme to just say we shouldn't have it at all. That's why I cannot agree with the folks that say that they're just anti-fracking. Um, well, it, you know, those, um, uh, those risks are about to uh, crystallize in a very, very clear way. I think to be certified, uh, I think our prediction, my prediction, is that given the number of uh, uh, signatures that were deposited on uh, August 6, that I'm, in, I'm anticipating that what was an issue of 97 will get on the ballot. And uh, that's a 2,500-foot setback, and it goes back to so many things such as fields and streams and rocks and places of historic interest. Could be anything. Uh, right. And the state of Colorado um, uh, has estimated that if you include the federal lands from that, you're talking about a number of over 85 percent of excluding those areas from future production. And in my view, if you run a business where you cannot exploit or do anything with 85 percent of your inventory, you pack up and leave. Yeah. And if this industry packs up and leaves, uh, it and, and these are older numbers. The prices have risen. The numbers of people are higher than the, the one I'm talking about. But in recent county, it was $31 billion. Uh, it was close to 100,000 direct jobs, 230,000 uh, indirect jobs, and uh, so much money to school districts. Um, uh, this state cannot, in my estimation, withstand uh, the economic result, were that industry to leave, and it can. It's very mobile. And if this becomes a state which is closed to oil and gas, which is what's going to happen, uh, I think that we're facing an economic uh, depression that we've never seen before. People say it'll be worse than 2008, and I said it's, not, it's nothing like that. It's that we've never had 31, 35 billion dollars of GDP just disappear, and that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I have several concerns about 97. Um, you know, the first one is having dealt with the budget for 16 years while I've been down there. Right, doing the long bill, right? Right, doing that long bill. You already struggle to yeah. come up with enough money for the things that you know. School, the people and the parents in the schools should be scared to death that this should pass. Because if they think there's a shortage of funds now, this is going to put it completely over the top. Our schools are going to lose millions and millions of dollars that we flat can't afford for those schools to lose. Right. Um, I think one of the other concerns I have is, uh, Peter, I have to tell you, I think it's already done some harm. Because when you have a state that is running initiatives like this, and they have gone after the oil and gas industry, you know, for quite, many years that I was that I was down there at some point you have these these industries that just say you know what I'm not playing anymore here yeah. I'm not playing anymore and I think that we've already caused some to leave uh, that is true I, I don't want to name names and I'm aware of a very large company that sold its assets in Colorado and went to Texas Permian Basin and it was a, a big sale and they just said we're out of here mm -hmm. there's another and, company packing up going to North Dakota and what if that were to happen with the entire industry? And who in the right mind would have any expectation that it would not happen if you take away 85% of the future development away? It's, it's, it's obvious to me. Well, the other thing that is concerning when you have these ballot measures is that, you know, people have a tendency to go by sound bites. Mm -hmm. And this is what, you know, the sound bite is on this instead of getting all of the facts, and I believe that it's up to the industry, which they're working so hard to get the facts out there, um, that what we do in Colorado is a magnificent job. And we have had a governor who um, uh, has made sure that we have really stringent oil and gas regulations. 
And he did that by bringing people together. So the oil and gas was at the table. Yeah, they came kicking and screaming sometimes. <laughs> okay, well, that's what you do. Um, and that's true with any industry. But by dang, they came to the table. And you had um, the policymakers and you had um, the, the environmentalist and yep. you had everyone at the table to help write these regulations. Yep. That's how you get stuff done. To completely <clears throat> annihilate an industry, which is exactly what this would do, right. that is not for the best interest of Colorado. And we need to just make sure that that message is getting out there. Well, that's what we'll be doing at Follow for Colorado with uh, your help. Uh, and the next 60 days are sort of all hands on deck and it is. try to get people just to talk about the issue, learn about the issue. Uh, uh, the state of Colorado, uh, John, do you know the, uh, where one can get that study? I suppose it's on a website, isn't it? Uh, yep. Go to vitalforcolorado.com. Uh, I believe it's under the Learn tab. We have information all throughout. And then there's also uh, a, a tax study, which is known in economic development circles as a REMI study, uh, yes. developed by the Common Sense Policy Roundtable that, that, that quantifies that into dollars. And then there's a map, I, I think, that, that we have, which uh, puts in colors and shows how much of the state would be taken offline. Yeah. Um, you know, the other question I have, and I know that we need to move on, but one of the other concerns I have is I would be almost – put everything on it, that it is not the local organizations that are really pushing this. I right. believe that there's a lot of out-of-state money coming in to run this campaign. I don't believe that the people in Jefferson County want this to go. Um, you know, I think that you're mostly targeting the people in Boulder, but I don't think it's the people in the state of Colorado that are putting all the money against this thing. No. We have a lot of information on that. Our, our research fellow, I think you've met him, uh, Simon Lomax uh -huh. has done an awful lot of research and writing on exactly that topic, and he not only knows who the people are, he knows how much money, and it's uh, out of state people coming to Colorado using this state as a petri dish, seeing what might happen in Colorado. If it happens in Colorado, maybe it can happen in New York or well, Peter, I can put some numbers else. to this too. Ninety percent of the funding for ninety-seven is coming from either out of state or Boulder County. Yeah, Only ten percent right. from. That's right from anywhere else in Colorado. So I think the majority sort of rational-minded people who, who may not love the oil and gas industry, no industry is perfect. Certainly, there are things that can be improved. I think about when, when you talked about bringing people to the table, I think about uh, Governor Hickenlooper essentially taking his staff at CDPHE, some members of industry and some members of environmental groups, and locking them in a room yep. and saying, you guys are going to figure out a new methane rule. You're going to get one that works for everyone, and don't come out until you do. That's exactly right. And I thought, God, what a great approach. It, I know one of the people who was in that room, and I think he has a different take on how that was. But uh, <laughs> despite some personal pain, uh, ultimately they got a rule. And now you're right. Industry goes, we can't, we can't live with this rule. Well, yes, you can. You're not out of business. You will figure it out. You will incorporate it, and you will evolve. And so with just a wholesale, like, let's lop off the head – Wow, you are. There's going to be so many ripple effects and unintended consequences that I don't think people are ready for. No. So pretty frightening. With our remaining time here, Sherry, we t we started this episode by talking about how you got into politics, right? And one of the things that we had talked about previous to to being on air was what comes after, right? You're now term limited, and so what is sort of what was your perception about what comes next? versus what is the reality? Well, you know, I've been thinking about that lately. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden it's, it's just gone, and I have loved so much working on issues and policy and really building teams and bridges and coming to um, coalitions. And so I, I've given a lot of thought as to, so after 18 years, really, when you count right. the two that I... Um, I believe that somewhere out there I have an expertise on how do you um, manage and, and finagle through the governmental uh, relations? How do you do that successfully? Yeah, how, how do you do, you do strategy? It? Yeah. How do you navigate that? How do you do the strategy um, uh, on the issues? And I think that working with people, that was the best thing that I and the, the most rewarding part that I could do was helping them navigate 
when they called me with an issue. And so I really believe that um, I'll be able to work with some of that in the future and wow. just helping people um, navigate through some of this stuff because it can be pretty, government's pretty bureaucratic have you, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. Um, the government, bureaucratic, go I on. I know, I know. Well, to help you with the plug, I, uh, and this is all brand new because we're really talking about just during the last month or so, uh, but I think you have uh, uh, formed a consultancy company and uh, starting um, to do work in that area. What's the name yeah. of your consultancy company? It is Ascend Consulting and Government Affairs. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Are on the web yet, yet or is that still no, uh, we're to working come in the on future? That. Okay. We're working on that. So you mentioned the people. What is, what is, besides the people, what is something that you are going to miss most about serving the legislature? I would have to say the policy and being able to help guide and steer mm. and working my hardest to bring people to um, the center and keeping them you know level so that it's not an extreme one way or the other right i was really really good at that and i loved so much working with everyone really? you know if you get to know people you're not going to agree with everybody all the time but you know you you're married and you, you don't agree with your wife all the time, but you don't divorce them because of it. <laughs> you know, you, you either come to an agreement or um, you respectfully disagree. But I was really good at that. And that's what I'm hoping to be able to continue doing. Is there something that you worked on that you point to where you go, that was the thing where I, I really brought people together. I, this is one of the things that I am most proud of. You, you got the Bridge Builder Award. Was there a piece yeah, of legislation there actually was. that's it took, emblematic of that? And it took me 13 years. Wow. Um, and I started when I was in the House, and Representative Lynn Hefley was actually the sponsor. But it was um, repealing a statute that said you may lock juveniles up for life without ever a chance of parole from the time they're 14 on. Oh my. Now, they're egregious crimes. I'm not disputing that. But they're 14, 15, so they're kids. What happened to redemption? What right. happened to yeah. uh, a second chance? What happened to that? So we did get that repealed. And then um, in 2016, was very proud of, of Senator Woods, Laura Woods. Um, boy, she really took a beating. I was used to it, so they kind of left me alone. But. <laughs> Um, actually taking it forward so that those people, the 48 that we have in the state, I still call them kids. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're, uh, one of them is my son's age, um, and I have followed him for years, that they actually have a chance because of a Supreme Court ruling, uh, five Supreme Court rulings actually, to have a resentencing hearing. Not, a, not necessarily a new trial. The judge can do that if they see fit. Yeah. But a resentencing hearing. Maybe they'll stay for the rest of their life if that's what the judge sees fit. Uh, maybe they'll get a new trial, but they should have that opportunity. And so we did get that passed. Wow. Um, I know it's being challenged, but um, I just, I cannot believe it's okay in this country One minute. for people to have the right to lock children away without ever a chance of parole. Yeah. That always bothered me and it took me 13 years. Wow. To get that done. Well, that is indeed a feather in your cap. Uh, with our remaining time, I would love for you to, where can people find Sherry John? If they want to get in touch with you, do you have a website, anything you want to point people I to? I do. Right now, they would just go to sherryjohn.com, C-H-E-R-I-J-A-H-N.com. Fantastic. Peter, a plug And if you go to Vital for Colorado, V-I-T-A-L-F-O-R, Colorado, uh, .com, you should see a photograph of Sherry John. Are you up on our website yet? I am working on that. All right. All right, we're getting there. You can listen to this episode as well as every episode on the aforementioned vitalforcolorado.com. It is under the Learn tab, videos and podcasts. You can see this episode, and we'll be back here very, very soon with a brand new episode. Peter, Sherry, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, John.